Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and my apologies for this delayed start. Uh, today is actually a very important day as far as Indian democracy is concerned. And as you know, the uh, counting process for the 18th parliament, if I'm not mistaken. Is that 18? Am I correct, sir? Anybody can correct me? 16th, 17th, 18th? With a 17th. So for the 17th um, Lok Sabha elections, uh, the counting begins at 8 o'clock, has begun at 8 o'clock. And I dare say that the uh, trends will be visible more towards the evening rather than the morning itself, as far as the outcome is concerned. Having said that, uh, we're in this uh, happy position of having to compete with the counting and the hustings. And um, as I say, my competition today is Mr. Modi and none, none else. So I'm gratified that I'm now in the stratos stratospheric atmosphere of competing with the greats of the world. Um, having said that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you all for your presence here this morning. And uh, a delayed start somewhat, and I do apologize to you for that. I believe our quorum of speakers is complete, and if, I, if I'm correct, may I therefore please invite all the speakers to join me on the stage. Uh, can I request Mr. Anil Srivastav? Is he here? Has he already arrived? Good morning, sir. Good morning. Hi, how are you? Welcome. Good morning. Yeah. We have met, yeah, and yeah. you don't remember. You won't Thank recognize sir. me. Yes, it's not really a pleasure to be here without seeing the results of everything. <laughs> Come, please sit, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, may I request uh, Vijay Jaswal, please, come and join us on the stage. And I believe we're going to have Chris, Chris Bollinger, please join me. And Sanshira, sir. Good morning, Sanshira, Sanshira, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I do want to give you a brief background before we get to the specifics of this session. Um, I'm actually a firm believer of uh, green transportation. And I believe that this is going to be the next great big challenge and opportunity as far as the world is concerned. Uh, if I hark back to a decade and a half ago, I would have said the same for, uh, for renewable energy. And if I went back another one and a half decades prior to that, I would have said the same for telecom, IT, and digital. And I think that we should take these as analogies for what is the potential in this sector. And we are going to see great things happening here. And of course, there are many, many incremental benefits as well. And those incremental benefits would be in terms of air pollution controls, health of individuals, global warming, and these are the incremental benefits that we would derive from green transportation. Now, I don't want to get into the specifics because the subject is somewhat different today. And I do want to mention that we were in connect with Moby, and uh, this uh, story or this journey starts with Mr. Pal right here. And we're connected together, and uh, he was mentioned in, in somewhat a, a serious fashion, and not lackadaisical, but in a serious mention. That, do you think that there is an opportunity to do a Moby colloquium in Delhi or in India? And I immediately pounced on the opportunity because I do believe that this is extremely important. So I want to thank you for reaching out to us. It's appropriate that this colloquium, therefore, is connected with the Smart Cities program. And I do want to, therefore, uh, urge everybody to be attentive as well as to listen with keen interest to what are the, gr what are the trends and the opportunities. Uh, a brief introduction uh, for all the uh, speakers on the dais. Uh, Chris Ballinger, CEO and founder of Mobi, Mobility Open Blockchain Initiative. And again, we're bringing in the element of digital into this enterprise. 
there is Mr. Anil Srivastav, advisor and director general of DEMO. Now, I'm sorry, I, I'm not too familiar with what DEMO stands for, but Niti Aayog, certainly, we, we all of us know uh, Niti Aayog. Uh, Mr. Srivastav is an IAS officer and, uh, and, and, and a very respected IAS officer. He's worked in transportation and uh, more in terms of uh, air transportation in the civil. Not with the Niti now. Not with, you're not with Niti anymore? No. Oh, that's a good challenge. <laughs> That's not in, uh, inappropriate, that's a good challenge. So thank you very much, sir, for being with us this morning. And I'm sure you would give us the benefit of all your experience. Uh, Vijay Jaiswal, Director Automotive Industries and Commerce from the government of Telangana. And uh, Vijay is um, uh, private sector as well as now public enterprise. And uh, I dare say he has a, a very good uh, experience because he's now working on this uh, government of Telangana program for uh, industries. So let's welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, why don't you give them both a big hand? A welcome. <laughs> and then we've got Sanshiro Fukao-san, senior analyst, author and uh, for auto and an author. Uh, very impeccable, uh, impeccable, uh, what is it? Uh, points of your career. Uh, he's an LSE graduate, London. That's an uh, eminent school. And just to let you know, my father was uh, uh, in, in there in the 30s somewhere. Um, you worked with Nomura Securities, HSBC, and Global Hedge Funds as a senior equity analyst. Uh, you're an opinion leader in the automo automotive industry, and we welcome you here. You've published a book, Mobility 2.0, Smartphoneization, excuse me, of automot automobiles with Nikkei Publishing, which is also an impec impeccable publishing house. So with those words, I'm going to leave you to the luminaries on the stage, and they will continue to enlighten us. Chris, I suppose you start? Sure. All right. So may I please welcome you to the microphone? Thank you very much. Welcome to the New Delhi Mobi Colloquium on blockchain and the future of mobility. Thank you so much for coming and for your interest. Thanks especially to Prem and uh, Richa and, and the whole Smart Cities India Expo team for hosting us and being so generous. Let me begin with uh, mo some words on mobility. Right? The quality of mobility is highly correlated with quality of life, right? Good mobility is freedom. In many places, good physical mobility, good transportation, is the biggest determinant of economic mobility, whether you can get that first good job, get on the first rung of the economic ladder. A personal car is often a family's highest material ambition. But mobility has its dark side. In some cities, average commuter, an average commuter spends up to four hours a day stuck in traffic and congestion. Globally, there are 1.2 million road deaths from accidents and perhaps, again, as many slow deaths from respiratory, heart, uh, and pollution-related diseases. Then there's global warming. About 50% of greenhouse gases in many countries now come from transit, hastening uh, perhaps a global catastrophe. But three technologies are converging that have the potential, potential to solve many of these problems. They are IoT, AI, and blockchain. And the place they converge is the smart city. In a nutshell, IoT devices create data that can be analyzed by machines. With blockchains and tokenized incentives aligning social and private costs. Now let me unpack that a bit. Roughly 25 billion of IoT devices exist today, a number which is doubling every two or three years, so 25, 50, 100, 200, uh, perhaps a trillion uh, by the end of the next decade. An IoT device is defined by an ability to sense some aspect of its environment, some ability to compute, 
and some capability to communicate with an external network. Most of these devices are in our cities. The tsunami of data produced will overwhelm human abilities, so it will be analyzed by machines through AI and ML, increasingly at the edge. In this massive decentralized machine economy, blockchains will permit trusted transactions between otherwise untrusted devices. All three technologies are needed to make our city smart, and the lack of any one collapses the stool. So we're going to explore that today. We're going to explore the potential of this historic convergence throughout the day with an outstanding roster of internationally recognized experts on smart cities, mobility, and this convergence of AI, IoT, and blockchain. So welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming, and enjoy the day. So, Fram, I think you were going to be the moderator. I'm taking over. All right. I'm in control. <laughs> I think our first speaker of the day. A very good morning to all of you, and uh, I must say that it uh, may not be a challenge challenge for you, but uh, certainly a challenge for being here instead of uh, in front of the TV screens, killing or <laughs> getting getting over the anxieties. But anyway, uh, whatever is going to happen is going to happen. Huh? Well, uh, thanks, Prem, for uh, excellent uh, introduction and all, and uh, I must. I uh, was trying to see the the website of movie yesterday after I have I had met Chris and Paul yesterday. So I must say, excellent uh, initiative, probably more needed in this country. Let me now I would elaborate as to why and how do I think like that. All that I will have to be speaking on uh, challenges of mobility in India. And uh, last two years, uh, I have been trying to drive mobility, being the advisor and subsequently principal advisor for the infrastructure, connectivity, transportation, for all the ministries of the government of India, interacting with the state governments, and uh, like this. So what uh, is uh, being happening and what we have been trying is uh, very different from what is happening globally and what is happening around. We started uh, to think about the EVs about uh, maybe 18 months back or something. Uh, we planned that, uh, yes, we must have EVs for the simple reasons, the pollution, the import of the, uh, import of the oil, uh, and other things. So EV was one thing on which we concentrated, and then uh, we also scaled up the levels. The things went to the uh, to the, the prime minister, his office, and everybody, and the top level. And then it was thought that it should be the mobility. If not the EV, it should be the mobility which should be handled. And then subsequently, we organized a, <coughs> a global uh, summit here in September in Vigyan Bhavan, and. Uh, I must say that uh, we attracted the attention of the world because uh, all the mobility leaders of the world were there in that, uh, in that uh, global summit. Uh, deliberations went on and we, were, we had five different themes in, on which we thought about it. So friends, I have little digressed a little bit. Why is India different? India is different when, we, when the Bloomberg comes out with its survey, when the Morgan Stanley says that uh, these are, these are the projections for the EVs when, uh, uh, when the battery people or the Solar Alliance or the ISFS says that uh, these are the requirements for the battery storage. Even then I feel, and it is, uh, one has, cannot forget that India is different in all these aspects. We, we generally keep thinking about 
the passenger vehicle density, the ownership of the passenger vehicles. Entire world talks about it when they talk about the mobility or the transportation or the vehicles. But it's totally different, this ability. 80% of our manufacturing of the automobile is two wheelers and three wheelers. And that is being reflected by the government of India's uh, policy for the fiscal incentives. We have put 100% emphasis on the two wheelers, three wheelers, public transportation, and then the fleet operations in terms of the passenger vehicles, well, as far as the incentives are concerned. So friends, India is different. India is different from the governance point of view. I'm dwelling on the challenges, challenges which the India's mobility has. Uh, India is different from the governance point of views. 90%, maybe a little less, 80, between 80 to 90% of the accidents on Indian roads go unreported. And even if they are reported, they are not reported the way they should have been reported and actually the way accident takes place. Only Chennai or the Tamil Nadu is the only state which has a well-established mechanism to rec record all the accidents. Otherwise, the rest of the states are trying to... Uh, my friend from uh, another southern state may be dwelling upon it a little more. So these are the, I mean, uh, uh, one of the governance issues. We have, we, have, we have quite far behind when it comes to the sustainable development goals. Now think about it, friends, how, how the development can take place without mobility. We talk about health for all. We talk about uh, institutional deliveries of the of the mothers, we talk about reducing the infant mortality rate, maternal mortality rate, we talk about the education, we talk about the primary education, how is it possible? Why is it that the girls' education is lower in the hinterland, in the villages? Because girls cannot reach to the school. So these are the challenges, the challenges are with the governance, the challenges are uh, the issues related with that, that the, the, we concentrate, we think about four-wheelers, we keep thinking about the developed uh, or the metros or the bigger cities. We forget about where the population travels. Such a huge size of informal transport systems. Sufficient research has been done during the last four or five years. And in fact, OECD did a remarkable study. And GTZ also came out with uh, a very big, uh, a very good study on the informal transportation systems in the country. Then when we talk about the challenges of the mobility in the country, Certainly, those are the challenges which are much more compared to any other country. India is different because of its sheer size. We are fourth, fifth biggest automobile manufacturers. We are manufacturing more cars than the Germany in terms of the internal combustion. But still, with that kind of a scale, are we catering to the needs of the people? Are we able to provide connected, shared, clean, convenient mobility solutions to the person who wants to move from point A to point B? Are we able to provide the kind of solution which should be there for the movement of goods and the freight? India is different. Mobility challenges in India are different, and I'm very sure that when Mobi looks into it, probably you will be finding that we need to handle those things in their own way. Uh, the entire socio-political milieu in India is, uh, is uh, different. You see, the elections, the results, the, the, the mix of the people, the way they, they react. We have a mindset, we have a strong mindset for the shared mobility. We are ready to accept it. But along with that, it also has a very positive impact when we look at the density of the cars. We have just 18 to 20 personal passenger vehicles per thousand of the population, which is around eight to 900 in US, four to 500 in Europe, maybe around 150 in China. So look at the disparities. So we are more prone to the shared mobility. There is an opportunity for the leapfrogging. Now friends, a lot of technologies are coming up. The vehicles should be talking to each other, which is not really happening. It's been trying, it's not happening globally also except at the select cities or select places. The vehicles should be talking to each other. Vehicles should be having a strong uh, positioning uh, software helping them. Uh, likewise, uh, artificial intelligence has got its own uh, applications. But to what extent artificial intelligence can be applied, that also needs to look, uh, 
looked into. We just cannot adopt these high sounding technology technologies or which are very capable, but then to what extent they can be applied to the real life ground situations in the country. The application of the technology in India would be different from the way they have been applied in California. It has to be, it has to be different, whether it is the, uh, whether it is the uh, internet of things, whether it is the artificial intelligence, whether it is the blockchain, whether it is the, uh, it is the Bitcoin. So you, you have to have the discrimination in the application of the technology for an Indian situation, Indian condition differently. And friends, if we just try to adopt it, take, take the models from uh, other countries, I must say that the days are gone. Earlier it used to happen. We were not so forward, we were not so advanced in terms of the technology development on our own. But now the situation is different. We have to look into the Indian situation and how do we adopt those te uh, technologies in India to cater to the Bharat along with the India as well. So when we think about and when we thought, uh, when we consider application of the technology, whether it is, uh, as I said, uh, the Bitcoin and along with the Bitcoin, uh, the blockchain, blockchain is successfully used in the Bitcoin, but the application of blockchain for which this colloquium is here, the application of blockchain for the Indian mobility scenario. The question is that, uh, to what extent blockchain is really required or is it really needed uh, for the mobility solutions in the country? Blockchain, uh, the first thing as a public uh, servant, as an administrator who has uh, worked, for, I mean, I have worked for 30, 34 years in the, in the government at the grassroots level, including the villages, blocks, tehsils, districts, and uh, divisional states, and then, then the government of India. At all these levels, when I look at it and when I, and uh, I do understand what the blockchain uh, blockchain is because of my professional uh, uh, backgrounds. Now, the, immediately as soon as somebody discusses with me as to what is the blockchain application, immediately the question comes to me, the first application of the blockchain should be for the land records, for the health, for the education, for these social sectors because these are the needs of this country. Well, friends, we are here to discuss the application of technology for uh, the mobility, mobility needs. Uh, I think I've tried to give a uh, lot of uh, food for the, for the thinking, for the thought. Uh, I also wanted to uh, lay, the, lay the base, lay the foundation as to in what direction the discussions or the thought process should be going on. Thank you very much, Premji, for uh, inviting me to be here, for sharing my ideas. Uh, when I got to know that this is going to be a, a forum for uh, discussing uh, technology application in the mobility, then I thought it is fair on my part that having worked for two years with various ministries of the government of India, whether it's shipping, aviation, road transport, or, uh, uh, or the railways, all these ministries, we need to integrate, we need to connect, we need to provide seamless solutions, we need to change the uh, sources of the energy. The sources of energy have to be clean. We have very ambitious uh, new and renewable energy target, 176 a gigawatt uh, kind of a thing. Now it comes in, then where is the battery to storage, to store that energy so that it should, could be fed into the grid at the appropriate times. There's a lot of uh, questions, a lot of issues which need to be handled and uh, I would be very happy if the technology provides uh, some solution for the leapfrogging for moving forward. Thank you very much. So good morning everyone, uh, quick introduction from my side. My name is Vijay Jaiswal and I'm working as Director of Automotive with Industries Department at Government of Telangana. Uh, I'm looking at the complete automotive sector activities including the current focus of the government on electric mobility and the related areas of uh, interest. So since we are uh, here to discuss about the mobility challenges for India, we have to just understand where it all starts from. So India has been moving towards a very rapid urbanization and that's where it all starts. A lot of people migrating to the cities, which so far has been some uh, five to six major cities, but in the recent times with uh, uh, action also happening at the tier two cities, 
what we see is that the tier 1 and tier 2 cities in india are showing a huge demand for transportation and personal mobility now how this all uh, like you know uh, fits in the frame so since time immemorial the need for people to move from work to home and home to work has been the crux of the whole story as in people need a transportation solution to do that movement in a very quick and efficient manner in case of india the whole requirement becomes a bit more complex and bit more critical because unlike the european and american cities the ownership of vehicles by individuals is still at a very low level be it two wheelers or four wheelers and that is where the reliance of these people on public transport and on shared transportation like auto rickshaws uh, other uh, indigenous solutions like uh, vikrams and all is quite high now we can always say that uh, maybe going ahead with the growth story that we have seen in the recent times or for a long time now a lot of people would move towards their own vehicles you know as their affordability and as their uh, financial status improves they would like to have their own vehicle and move towards uh, their buying their own vehicles but then also realize that the traffic congestions in the cities is also making people realize that uh, owning a vehicle may not always make sense the parking issues the congestion issues and also the pollution issues is something which are thankfully stopping them and making them think that do they need a vehicle and then we also see a surge in the demand for services like ola and uber and which tells us that people are realizing that there is an alternative to owning a vehicle by moving towards uh, shared taxis and also towards uh, <clears throat> the mobility solutions which india has embraced very well like metros and all and this works well when we think of a very uh, you know, sustainable transportation model for a country like india because if we continue had these solutions and options not been there and we would have had a scenario where people will only and only think of personal uh, mobility like for a country like U- uk us and with the vehicle penetration level of 800 to 900 cars per 1000 people we realize that if we ever move to that kind of scenario we will not be having a very uh, good scenario to look at in terms of congestions and in terms of pollution and all that so there is a demand for vehicles but thankfully the demand is now getting served through uh, public transport through shared mobility and all now one good advantage that we see of switch towards these options is that these options are also a good playground for ideas like green mobility so uh in the recent times we have been talking about green mobility which primarily means electric vehicles in india and electric vehicles mix in india spans you know like ranges from electric two wheelers electric three wheelers electric cars electric buses and so on and so forth so with the current scenario that we have that people are in need of mobility when people are realizing that uh, shared mobility is a good al- alternative to buying a vehicle and where the shared mobility providers realize that electric vehicles may make a good business sense for them considering the tco of the vehicles the total cost of ownership because of high utilization so this challenge of serving the people's need for mobility has also given an opportunity for us to look at the green mobility solution in indian context what we gain in return is that we are able to mitigate the cost to the environment by switching towards green mobility what we also gain is some kind of a, a positive scenario where we would be more or less uh, energy self sufficient in terms of the energy requirement or the energy demand we would be reducing our spend on the fossil fuel which is currently largely imported now that's the electric mobility part and 
it's it's a long discussion in in itself so we can keep on talking about electric mobility and the story would keep on expanding with all the ideas that might be looked into and all the opportunities that might be there for us to explore what thankfully is also happening along with the focus on electric mobility is the focus on the emerging trends like autonomous and connected and uh, other areas which is uh, there for us to look at at the global end at the, at the global landscape as also in the indian context combine electric vehicles with the ideas like autonomous and connected which brings in technologies like ai and iot and blockchain and we are considering we are looking at a very 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 efficient transportation model not just from the environment perspective but also from the efficiency and safety and convenience perspective so think of a connected vehicle i'm just taking one use case so think of a connected vehicle in logistics i'm drifting a bit away from the um, the personal mobility and more towards freight and all a connected transport vehicle moving our stuff from point a to point b if the status of the vehicle is getting fed continuously to the owner of the vehicle or to the fleet operator he is able to define and devise ways to make the whole moment more efficient and as we say what gets measured gets improved and corrected so with the constant feedback that he is getting and he is able to find ways and means to fill the gaps in terms of efficiency and also in terms of the whole uh, experience that he is delivering to the customer at the end of the day what he is also able to ensure and there are solutions which people are developing and deploying is that these connected vehicle or autonomous uh, connected vehicle technologies are providing is to ensuring better uh, driving behavior and this applies to people or the drivers in the truck segment as also in the taxi segment so again what gets measured gets improved so a driver if he is working long hours and his behavior is uh, uh, kind of you know bordering on uh, a bit risky or a rash uh, driving behavior and if the feedback is going back to the taxi operator or the fleet owner he would send an alarm and tell him that you please take a break and don't drive anymore which otherwise would not be the case he would continue driving without any kind any such feedback this whole idea of connected technology also works well for public transport because india is a country with limited resources we are a developing country we still don't have the luxury of maybe you know still deploy as many vehicles as we can to meet the transportation demand the connected vehicle technology helps the rtcs and the and the and the stus to deploy these vehicles in a very efficient manner looking at the routes where the demand is more so maybe like just i just i'll just go back to the whole uh, try to i think i uh, through uh, through a bit random idea i'll try to summarize it again here so the mobility challenges for india starts from the fact that there is a huge demand over there the opportunity is that the demand can be uh, directed towards a greener and a more efficient way of moving people around this whole idea of green and efficient mode of transport also creates a good business case where the assets are ut utilized in a much more efficient manner and this is where the government if it creates a good framework for these technology deployments will invite a lot of interest from the for the private players now here i represent the telangana state government and would like to mention a few things which we have done so far to bring these technologies to the people so over the last many years uh, i would say at least uh, since 2014 when the state was formed we have worked a lot to improve the public transport in the state and one of those uh, one of the things that we did was to uh, start our metro uh, network in the city 
I am proud to say that the Hyderabad Metro network is one of the uh, longest phase one implementation in the country, and probably uh, when we say uh, the phase one, phase two, phase three combined, it will be one of the um, longest again. Maybe uh, Delhi would be uh, Delhi NCR would be an exception. Uh, after Delhi NCR, Hyderabad would be one of the most um, the longest metro train network stretch anywhere in the country. What we have also done is that we have started looking at the RTC bus fleet's migration towards electric vehicles. And again, a matter for, for, of pride for me to share that currently we have got 40 electric buses running on the Hyderabad roads as a part of the RTC fleet, saving almost 4,884 tons of carbon emission every year. That's the number I have with me right now. What we also have in Hyderabad is a very strong startup ecosystem which has been very ably supported by the state government and in that startup ecosystem we have got some very very promising startups working on the mobility solutions these mobility solutions uh, range right from the uh, vehicle the automotive products to technologies like connected vehicles so at least i personally you know five companies who are working on te connected technology solutions for uh, um, trucks and for logistics sector at least three companies, homegrown companies, who are looking at electric products, and one of them is a pioneer in India in terms of an electric three-wheeler. We have a lot of interest from the shared mobility companies uh, in Hyderabad for deployment of electric vehicles. So we already have Zoomcar and Uber deploying electric vehicles. We have a company from Bangalore called Lithium, which has deployed almost 150 electric cars in Hyderabad at various offices like Google and Wipro. We also have Hyderabad Metro uh, Limited uh, come out with a tender for 100 electric auto rickshaws for last mile connectivity for the people in Hyderabad. And apart from that, what we also uh, have is, of, uh, is the Hyderabad's position on India's landscape as a technology hub. So we are only second to Bangalore in terms of the uh, software exports and we are uh, leveraging that position of ours very well to attract the technology companies in the automotive space to come and do their work in Hyderabad. So we have a Hyundai R&D center there, we have a ZF R&D center there, we have got a lot of Indian auto, uh, auto, uh, like uh, technology companies doing very advanced automotive technology development there in Hyderabad. And when I say that these things are happening in Hyderabad, I, 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 there's a lot of uh, government policy enabling that is happening at the back end to make it happen. The government of Telangana has been very, very, very supportive of all the technology companies since, since uh, as long as I remember. But going ahead, we are also very much focused on the promotion of electric mobility in the city. And we have saw, seen extremely good results on the ground. And this all then feeds back into our overall idea of meeting the demand of transportation for the people in a very efficient and eco-friendly and convenient and comfortable way for the people. Thank you so much. Thank you. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, my friend, Sanchez Patayo. Uh, Patayo uh, not only went to LSC, uh, but he's probably the most respected auto analyst uh, in Japan of the traditional auto industry. Uh, and with the publication of his book, Mobility 2.0, the smartphoneization uh, of the vehicle, uh, it probably cemented his position as the leading analyst of new and shared mobility as well. So with that, uh, please welcome Sanchez Takayo. <coughs> okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Before entering my presentation, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity <coughs> Uh, to thank all of you here and also the organizer of this event for having give me, given me uh, such an honored opportunity to uh, make a speech. I'm the only Japanese speaker today, but um, I'm not going to talk about Suzuki, Honda, or Toyota, or whatever. <laughs> but um, let me just uh, start with my presentation. Uh, I think the slide is not here, actually. It's uh, so working on now. So set. I, I'm prepared with uh, presentation slides, uh, which is not on my PC right now here. So just take uh, a couple minutes to fix it. Yo, yo. I got it. Face down. 
Yeah, um, just um, being introduced, I, I, I'm a Japanese, and I, I was born in 1981 in the center of Tokyo as a millennial, and had been educated in uh, Japan and also in the UK, uh, where I used to study at the London School of Economics. Uh, maybe you know how the university that nurtures politicians, policymakers, and economists. So um, I'm not an engineer of blockchain, but uh, I'm going to uh, give you this presentation uh, as an economist's point of view. Uh, point of view. My presentation is titled Smartphoneization of Vehicles, um, Blockchain Creating Future Mobility for Cities and the Millennials in Asia. So what I'd like to tell you today are three bits. The first three, um, I'm gonna tell you about stories behind the disruption in auto industry globally. And I'm gonna talk about uh, so-called diseconomies of scale, which is why auto OEMs or auto assemblers are frustrated these days. The second point is that mobility is not about a car, but ecosystem in cities where resources are changing from petrol to data. The last bit of my presentation is to focus on generation. Generation matters in Asia. Millennials are redefining motorization. So I'm purposed to be here uh, to tell you uh, about what's happening in the auto industry as a whole. And also I'd like to uh, provide you uh, with the basis for discussion uh, for India and, uh, and also for Mobi uh, to seek uh, the growth and the prosperity in the auto industry. Oops, sorry, it's, uh, it's the other, sorry, it's, uh, I'm starting with this, yeah. Okay, it's, uh, it's a big picture uh, talk. Um, you know that the automobile industry in the world is uh, facing disruption and um, my understanding is that this disruption is driven by change in three mega trends. Firstly, it's the change in generation, in which we have uh, the emergence of the millennials and post-millennials. Maybe you know that po millennials are those cohorts uh, who were born in 1980s and 1990s. And now we are having the new generation, so-called post-millennials, uh, who were born in the year 2000 onwards. I'm going to uh, tell you about this uh, in details later. Uh, the next mega trend is the changing era. Uh, we human beings are facing the new era uh, where uh, we have to tackle with um, the issues arriving from global warming or urbanizations or this kind of um, big issues globally. So two key words. The one is decarbonization, which is quite easy. You have to tackle with the increase in especially uh, CO2. Uh, the next one is about urbanization, which is going to be explained by Trump later. It's the population uh, concentrating to uh, urban cities. The last bit is about mega trend change in society, uh, in which the keyword is digitalization. So I think the generation change is about a 20 years phenomena. The changing era is like 50 years phenomena. The society is about 500 years if we are going to talk about the blockchain. I think this is quite weird. It's going to be a little bit of uh, economics talk. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, 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 why, uh, why auto, in auto companies, especially assemblers, are really frustrated these days, which, is, uh, which can be explained by the economist, economics term called diseconomies of scale. Yeah. This is quite weird. Okay, slide, I'm sorry. Down. Yeah, I said, uh, sim in simple words, uh, this economy of scale is, uh, is at where uh, the more a car company produces, 
that's right here. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> sorry, even though I'm Japanese, but I'm not really tech guy. <laughs> uh, the more it makes loss. So uh, what it means is that you know, uh, as um, you have many mass-produced manufacturers, of such as autos, mm. uh, you see the commoditization of vehicles, which means that the prices of, or values of cars are declining. That's, the, that's, 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 uh, that's something all the industries face. But at the initial phase of production, uh, you, can, you can make your company uh, more profitable uh, by diluting fixed costs. So that's why all the companies produce more. But from at some point of the production level, uh, you see the increase in some costs related to uh, the volume of production or sales of cars. That cost is uh, called the transaction costs. Especially in auto industries now, we are facing three transaction cost increase. The one is the cost to improve product quality. The second is research and development costs, mainly uh, overhead costs. Thirdly, it's a sales incentives to dealers. So if you're facing this kind of situation, if you make more cars, you're becoming less profitable. And eventually, you are making loss by making cars. And uh, any industries, uh, when uh, it faces digitalization, you see this phenomena. And this is what smartphone industry faced, actually. And now auto industry is now facing this situation right now. That's why automobile industries, especially the car manufacturers, are very frustrated to do business because if they make more cars, you are becoming less profitable. It's a bit of a mess. I'm going to tell you about this in details so that we can figure out what we should do in the future. That's the profitability from manufacturer's standpoint. Basically, you take four actions to escape from this situation. Firstly, it's very easy. If you make more cars, the less you're profitable. In other words, if you produce less, more you're profitable. So some companies like General Motors or Honda are now slashing production and uh, or even shut down factories, manufacturing cars with so-called ICE, internal combustion engines. So like GM closing factory in India, and Honda uh, is going to close factory in UK and um, possibly in Turkey as well. But at the same time, they're making more electric vehicles and or autonomous vehicles. So they're making the change of the stage of competition. These are fast actions that car companies can easily take. The other action is to make cars more sexy, I'd say. Um, this is what's happening uh, in the car dealers uh, in uh, developed countries, such as the UK or even US. There is some uh, developer of augmented reality and virtual reality uh, who's making software for car dealers that can increase the values for customer. This is a case of uh, um, uh, Zero Light, uh, which is uh, one of the uh, game changes in this field in UK. And Audi and BMWs uh, are increasing introduce this system at the dealers, so that the values by customer has increased by 20 to 30 percent by providing better options for uh, the, the, the car buyers, more options more high price options. So that's one way. And uh, you can imagine that this kind of AR and VR technologies is increasingly uh, backboned by blockchain these days. Uh, the other way of uh, tackling with uh, this uh, uh, situation is uh, uh, two bits. Uh, the, the first three, uh, well, both of these could be uh, based on blockchain as well. The first three is to push down quality costs or just uh, uh, lift, it, lift down uh, the, the cost curve uh, by increasing traceability in supply chain management, which is what Mobi is now doing uh, as a working group. 
The second one is uh, actually, um, uh, this is called a, a direct to digital manufacturing, or DDM, or uh, 3D printing. Uh, dramatically uh, dropping down the cost of making cars by slashing uh, the number of engineers. Uh, this is backbone by um, um, blockchain as well. Uh, one of the good examples is called uh, HackRot, uh, the American company uh, from California, who's now making cars with 3D printing. Uh, we are seeing this kind of uh, good use cases uh, in the last half a year or a year already. The last action is very easy, just to escape from this game. Yeah. Especially from the, the, the viewpoint of policymakers, you know, they don't want car companies to slash production in order to sustain the, the, the employees' employment. Right. But car companies want to change this game. So where are they going? They're going to the new ecosystem of mobility. Uh, you know that uh, in the auto industries, uh, ecosystem is the word increasingly used these days. Yeah. It's very difficult to capture what's happening as a kind of ecosystem players or whatever, but uh, this is the, the way I look at. So I, I simplify or visualize what's happening when we are talking about the ecosystem. Uh, if you see the big bubbles, it's centered on the electric vehicles mostly battery EVs. Uh, to be honest, it's very easy to make it because uh, the car with uh, engines have about 20 to 30,000 parts per vehicle, but uh, battery EVs is about 5,000 to 6,000. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's costly right now, but it's easy to make. So reducing complexity, uh, complexity of making EVs is quite important to nurture this new ecosystem where the resources are changing from uh, steel or petrol to data. So this new ecosystem centered around EVs. Oh, yep, it's better. <laughs> Increasingly, it's being on sharing platform. You see like orders here. Okay, in the uh, Asian countries, we have Grab, Gojek, whatever, Uber, Lyft in the U.S., Didi Choosing. Uh, you must notice that you know, they are focusing on EVs because they want to uh, place EVs on these platforms. And these EVs are increasingly become autonomous. Now, when we are having a level four, level five autonomy uh, on the sharing platform uh, with battery EVs, it's becoming eventually uh, robot taxis or autonomous bus shuttles. So this is what's happening, and this is what's happening in the cities uh, where urbanization is stretching out uh, this new ecosystem. So if you, if, you, if you hear about uh, the management of, uh, or, or top management of uh, uh, auto companies, especially in Japan, some uh, president saying that uh, we are facing once in 100 years catastro catastrophe, or once in 100 years of big change. Yes, it is actually uh, once in 100 years phenomena. You know, 100 years ago, you know, that the, uh, all, the, the, all the, uh, the yellow cabs or taxis in New York City were battery EVs, which was uh, made by uh, Philadelphia electric vehicle manufacturers. And then, you know, the father of auto industry, um, Ferdinand Porsche, uh, he made the first car as a battery EVs. So what's happening in terms of electrification is actually once in 100 years phenomena. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, this, call, uh, this word called the case, the connected, electric, uh, autonomous, sharing, electrified. This word was made by Daimler in 2016. This is a word created by auto manufacturers. This is uh, the, the, the why the car companies are really frustrated. They, they, they find it quite difficult to understand what's, what's going on right now and uh, uh, derive some solutions from uh, digitalization. But if you look at from this side, from this side, from right to left, from the standpoint of policymakers or public transporters, uh, this is what they have been thinking about in the last 100 years. They're thinking about uh, the residents, local residents in the cities. 
how you, know, you can satisfy the needs of mobility for the residents in your area. So for, for the standpoint of auto manufacturers, this is something really uh, out of, uh, it's, it's very difficult to understand, but from the standpoint of cities and um, public transporters, it's not that difficult. And uh, we are seeing digitalization process of this auto industry. Uh, increasingly, cities and the public transporters are important uh, to uh, grow this uh, new ecosystem or new industry called mobility. And uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure about it in India, but in Japan or uh, in Europe or states, uh, we are having the word called the mobility as a service mass. Uh, to satisfy the needs uh, of mobility in the local areas or areas you are responsible for. Yeah. So this is the kind of ecosystem we are talking about. The, uh, uh, it's data-driven, and the number of cars produced is not really important. But what is very important is miles-driven. So what I'd like to tell you here is that, you know, um, uh, what's happening in auto industries now uh, now is a digitalization process. The, from the policy makers' stand, uh, point of view, uh, because uh, you don't want car companies to uh, slash production, but uh, policy makers want to nurture this new ecosystem where the employment is going to create it. So electrification is a tool for policymakers to digitalize this new industry. So number of battery EVs produced is not really important because it's gonna be like a smartphone. Like it, it's not making money. Yeah. But you can make money, I'm sorry, it's not good to uh, tell <laughs> like, uh, like money, 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 but, uh, um, but still you need a business here, right? But from the standpoint of, uh, of policymakers, this is a new industry. Uh, everybody is now seeking. Uh, to create. The lastly, what I want to tell you is that what we are seeing now here to create a new industry is becoming more human-centric approach. So from the standpoint of automakers, you start with making cars with engines and then electrification is a, the, the, the current step, but which is driven by the product. So it's a product-centric approach is from here to there. But in, in the standard point of the cities and the public transporters, they're always thinking about the residents, local residents, and then try to figure out uh, the, uh, the, the, the solutions to uh, natural this industry. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a human-centric approach. So, so the, the, the how to see the industry is re changing really uh, fast, and uh, you know, and what's happening uh, uh, in the industry uh, or mobility industry is not that new. We are doing what we have been doing the last hundred years, but we just uh, change the viewpoint of what to do. So that's what I wanted to tell you. It's gonna be a little bit messy, but uh, in such an environment where the, 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 the resources are data, and uh, as I said, that the miles driven is very important. You know, that, that uh, here is a discussion about blockchain, uh, increasing the utilization rate of cars and I in which you can make a new industry. And uh, I'm trying to figure out and how to like, uh, uh, um, uh, quantify this new industry. It's like just in uh, this red box, like uh, as I said, it's a mobility service revenues. Uh, you know, it's kind of a new industry uh, in my world, which can be uh, uh, made of three bits. Like you see like miles driven times, uh, data transaction per mile times, uh, it's, uh, this is the uh, SNS or IT industries world, ARP. Average revenue per paid user. So this is a kind of equation that the SNS and IT industries is always talking about. But this is what we have to talk about in the uh, mobility sector as well. In order to increase the, 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 the miles driven, uh, you need to expand the sharing network fast. In order to increase the data transacted in the car, uh, you need to have more fully um, uh, autonomous vehicles because passengers, drivers can do something else. Like smartphones, you can approach to the, some applications. If you use it, data is transacted. 
So in terms of uh, such kind of applications, you have to think about the contents of applications, which is the important part uh, to increase the ARP, average revenues per paid user per data. The sharing network, automated vehicles, and mobility as a services, new applications, these are the three keywords to grow this industry. Blockchain is going to be the key technology to support this development, I believe. Okay, lastly, I'm going to um, talk about the generation. Yeah. Uh, as I said, the millennials are the world's largest generation. Here uh, is a summary of uh, how big they are. Uh, population by generation, uh, which was uh, published by um, IMF and United Nations, the World Bank, and I summarized these. Like in the world now, 32% of total uh, population in the world uh, is millennials who were born in 1980s and 1990s, which is the largest of the world, which is followed by uh, post-millennials uh, holding 26% of the total population in the world. Altogether, it's more than half. So which means that you know, um, in terms of creating uh, services and goods, in any industries, firstly you listen to them. Yeah, that's uh, that's a better way to uh, to do business and also to uh, nurture industry. Yeah. But if you see uh, 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 these uh, uh, population breakdowns uh, in region, in the key regions and the countries like Japan, U.S., EU, and even China, uh, these generations are less than half. So they're already facing uh, uh, age to society. So we have to uh, seek uh, solutions for uh, these aging societies in terms of mobility, especially. Uh, in terms of ASEAN and here in India and Africa, you know, we are having a uh, much larger uh, portion of these young people. So solutions for so-called digital natives are the key for the industry. This is a different way to look at. Um, Population of millennials by country, and uh, that's uh, x, x axis is the, uh, the real GDP per capita. The y axis is the percentage of millennials versus total population of a country. The, 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 the scale of bubble is uh, the, uh, the magnitude or the number of populations in these generations. But it's very easy to see that like, uh, emerging countries uh, having uh, young people. But what uh, the, the, the conclusion I'd like to draw from uh, this analysis is, is that you know, uh, th there's a greater potential for two wheels market. That's, uh, that's what I want to uh, emphasize. Yeah, um, the discourse of auto industry or auto industry, uh, there's a word called the motorization. Motorization is a classical uh, theory that you know, at the uh, GDP per capita of 3,000 US dollar, you see the rapid increase uh, in demand for uh, four wheels, uh, shifting from two wheels. It has been working quite well in the last 20 years, especially in, in Asia, especially in ASEAN regions. But these days we're seeing a solid demand for two wheels. And I think that's because of digitalization in the markets. Especially if you see like India or Indonesia, uh, where we have uh, sharing platforms like Aura or Gojek or Grab, uh, we are seeing shared mobilities these days. So that, you know, uh, if we are looking at the industry in the context of a generation, uh, i.e. Uh, millennials, uh, we could talk a lot about the new industries. So maybe in my, well, in my, in my view opinion, the like two-wheel market is still uh, has a huge potentiality if it's electrified and shared and possibly uh, backbone, uh, backbone by a uh, blockchain. So this could be another, I think, uh, discussion point for Mobi in the future in terms of working groups, I think. Yeah, so, uh, well, it's about time. So what I wanted to tell you today was three bits. Uh, as I said, like uh, the, the why auto OEMs are frustrated is that this economy is of scale. The more you produce, the less you're profitable. But you are so many actions uh, to escape from uh, this situation by, uh, I believe that the application of blockchain is going to solve this problem. 
The second is mobility is not about car, but ecosystem in cities. And the, the largest demand of mobility, or next generation mobility, will be cities, which is different view of looking at the industry, I think, and uh, where the resources are changing from petrol to data, data driven. So this is digitalization process that we have seen in smartphone industries already. That's why I'm saying the smartphoneization of eco is this. The last bit is generation matters in Asia. So millennials are redefining motorization. So with this, I think a key point that uh, we could uh, um, elaborate our discussions about uh, next generation mobility, which sounds like a new industry, right? I mean, if you, if you hear about auto or uh, the management of auto manufacturers, like, uh, you know, it sounds less optimist or opportunistic, but uh, if we look at different way like this, uh, this is what uh, we are going to develop, and uh, this is a growing industry where we're going to have a young and very energetic uh, generations um, growing these uh, opportunistic industries, especially in Asia and even in India. So digitalization is a key word. And uh, we can talk uh, many things about uh, to grow this industry and also the country. Yeah, yeah I think that's um, my presentation uh, for today. And I think I'm going to take questions uh, during the break. I think so it's a matter of time. So thank you very much and uh, namaste. And then uh, I'll see you again. <laughs> Thanks, Sanjiro. All right. So that's my clicker. So this next section hopefully will be a little bit of a bridge from this morning where we talked about existing conditions, existing economy, some of the challenges in cities to, to blockchain. Alrighty. Uh, so my background is the auto industry. I worked for Toyota for 16 years, was the CFO of the largest subsidiary. Uh, spent two years also working at Toyota Research Institute in Palo Alto, which is the place where they're developing autonomous cars. Uh, and while there, uh, began to do some proof of concepts around blockchains, not so much for financial applications, but for applications in the physical world. How do cars talk to infrastructure, how do they identify themselves in the digital world, how do they transact with infrastructure, pay as you go in this mobility as a service economy. And we, uh, we did a bunch of, of uh, POCs with a bunch of startups, uh, one of which is, is actually here today and you can hear from them later, uh, Ocean Protocol, who back then used to be known as Big Chain or Big Chain DB. Uh, and several years ago, uh, they were amongst the POCs that we did. And we presented, I think, three years ago at Consensus, which is a big uh, conference in New York City, a big blockchain conference in New York City. And uh, as after we uh, presented there, I began hearing from my peers at all these other auto companies and tech companies. Uh, and they would say to me things like, oh, we did that same POC, or we thought about that same thing. Uh, and we found out it was really easy to put an asset on a blockchain, really easy to put a vehicle on a blockchain. But now what do we do? And we were all kind of looking at each other and talking and saying, OK, well, we, we did the POC. It was successful. How do we get to scale? Uh, and it turned out that was the hard problem. And so I want to talk a little bit about that hard problem and how we're trying to solve it in a minute. Um, but before I do, all right, how do I advance? Point this there. And I'll just use the computer. OK, before I do, I don't want to give a, a talk on blockchain. I don't want to do uh, blockchain 101. But I do just want to give you two quotes uh, from people uh, who are smarter than me on why blockchains might be important and why you should pay attention to this technology. Uh, World Economic Forum said a few years back, 10% of global GDP will be stored on blockchains by 2025. 2025, so six years from now, 10% of global GDP, roughly $10 trillion. Uh, that's uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, economic transactions. Uh, so 
this is going to happen if they're right uh, very, very quickly uh, in a big way. Uh, the second quote, as disruptive and important as the internet and the PC. Okay. Uh, that one from uh, Mark Andreessen, uh, the inventor of the Netscape browser, the man who's probably as much as anyone responsible for the way we use uh, PCs, access the internet, uh, surf the web, uh, et cetera. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, within the auto industry, uh, IBM did a, a survey of auto executives just recently. Uh, they, the headline was, uh, Blockchain Brings Trust to How Companies, Consumers, and Cars Connect. Uh, the result of the study uh, was that uh, OEMs and suppliers uh, are not ready. Uh, but what they found was that uh, uh, almost two-thirds of auto executives thought that in the next two years, a year and a half, uh, blockchains would be a disruptive element in the auto industry and in mobility. So they know it's coming, uh, but they don't quite know what to do about it. Let me quickly just say why I think, uh, what are the key features of blockchains that we should keep in mind? Uh, one of the aspects is mutualized data. So the ability to share data between otherwise untrusted parties. Now, if you've worked in a big corporation, uh, your IT department is always telling you, we need to have a single source of truth, we need to have a corporate data store, right? And that is so, right, data within the company can be trusted and known to be accurate. Because if you go back to the days of PCs and vertical silos, uh, what you get is, is each department of a company coming up with their own answer to a question, coming up with their own reports, and they're mutually contradictory. And, uh, and CEOs and CFOs were very frustrated. They couldn't trust data. They couldn't trust financial reports. And so a single source of data became uh, the rallying cry for big corporate IT departments. Uh, and uh, if you think about what's going on in a wider business network, when you have many companies working together in an ecosystem, uh, having one source of data, right, a single source that can be trusted, has to be done in a slightly different way because uh, you don't want to give one party you don't trust access to the root, because anybody with access to the root can change the data, and then it can't be trusted. Uh, and so you have to find some other way uh, to create trust, and blockchains can provide uh, that trusted uh, so, uh, uh, trust element uh, to allow data to be mutualized amongst a broader untrusted business network. And the second aspect of blockchains is they allow the creation of digital twins digital representations of physical things, digital identities that can be logged on a blockchain right, and transacted, for example, uh, at a title of a car, right, can be transacted with a smart contract if it's, if it's digitized. So those are two things to keep in mind, that most, uh, most of the use cases of blockchain, uh, not only in automotive but every, everywhere, uh, have in common. When you look deeper under the hood, of somebody proposing a blockchain solution to a problem, you usually find one or two of these, or uh, more often, some elements of both. Let me go through some of the use cases in automotive. Uh, and these were the things that when I began to talk to my peers after that consensus uh, presentation, uh, that uh, we began to list what were the POCs that we'd done, uh, what were the use cases in automotive. Digital identity and vehicle history, that's that digital twin. Usage-based insurance, that was one the insurance companies were very interested in because they realized that uh, insurance based on uh, driver habits uh, was going to go away in a, in a mobility as a service economy. Uh, driving and autonomous vehicle data exchange, so the provenance of data in an automated economy. Uh, supply chain tracking, uh, somebody mentioned that, uh, Sincero mentioned that one earlier. Uh, EV grid metering and storage. Uh, we have a speaker for pools going to talk about that one later on. Uh, car and ride sharing. We have somebody from Ola here today. Uh, mobility commerce, cars wallet, the ability of a car to pay as you go, make exchanges. Uh, autonomous vehicle to vehicle payments and coordination. Uh, we're going to have some sessions on that. Usage based fees, taxes, tolls, carbon, uh, and tokenizing the mobility services economy. So these were all the things that a few years ago people were talking about in the automotive industry. Everybody was doing POCs, everybody was doing the same POCs, everybody was successfully doing the POC, and then it didn't go anywhere because there was no way to get from POC 
to scale. And so everybody realized about the same, same time that the hard problem was building a minimum viable community. Right? The problem isn't building a minimum viable product here, it's building a minimum viable community. And a lot of people were out there already saying this. Uh, Brian Bellendorf, for example, uh, who's the uh, head executive director of the Hyperledger Linux Foundation, always says in every one of his talks, and he talks probably five times a week, uh, that blockchain is a team sport. You'll hear that a lot. Uh, Scott Stornetta, who was the person most cited in the original Satoshi Nakamoto white paper, I think it was uh, uh, three or four sites out of eight, uh, said in a, in, a, in a big survey uh, retrospective written December of last year, said successful blockchain efforts don't begin with technology, they begin with the community. And this is what we found uh, talking amongst our peers as well. Um, we began uh, with a very small group of about 10 people uh, talking under the auspices of MIT Media Lab uh, about uh, two years ago. Uh, we began having meetings every three or four weeks. In each meeting, we pick up a couple more engineers, a couple more auto companies, a couple more technology companies, a couple more startups, uh, until we had more than 50% of the world's automakers in the room at the table talking about these problems, talking about how do we build a big enough community so that we can launch this? How can we get to scale? Uh, and so we, we launched Mobi officially on May 2nd last year at a big conference in Dubai uh, with that banner, Hello World. Uh, what was Mobi? Uh, sorry, wrong direction there. Uh, was a nonprofit foundation uh, with the goal of uh, making uh, technology, uh, making mobility uh, safer and greener through the adoption of standards, uh, digital identities, ways of transacting between vehicles and, and infrastructure. Uh, it was open. Uh, it was not, it was technology agnostic, not linked to any one underlying uh, blockchain or, or digital community. Uh, who was Moby? Uh, we launched with 35 members. Uh, we've grown to uh, well over 100 cents, uh, actually more than 70% of the world's large automakers now, along with many startups, nonprofits, uh, transit agencies, uh, 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 agencies like the World Economic Forum are members of Mobi, uh, all the big blockchain communities, uh, R3, Consensus, um, uh, 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 and uh, Hyperledger uh, and others are members of Mobi as well. So we've grown quite rapidly. I'll get this right by the end of the talk. There we go. So everybody who talks about mobility and what's going on in mobility has some cute acronym for, to help them remember the disruption and the changes that are happening. Uh, Sanchero had his, his case? Case, uh, yeah. So I have mine, which is the basics. Uh, so basically I have the same ones as his mostly, except I add the B for blockchain. Uh, but let me take it from the bottom. Uh, connected, right? And so, so if you're not from the auto industry, uh, it's hard to understand the magnitude of the change. Uh, auto industry has used the same business model of selling cars, largely through dealerships, to people who want to own them and mostly leave them around unused for like 90 to 95 or even more percent of the time. There's no other asset that we pay so much for and then utilize so little. Right? It's really unusual when you think about it. Uh, but that model of the last 100 years is going to change totally in the next uh, five to 10 years. And it's going to change uh, for these reasons. Let me start at the bottom with connected. Uh, so cars are now connected, mobile phones and, and native uh, connections in the cars. Uh, the connections along with the introduction of, of sensors and computing power is turning the cars themselves into nodes on the IoT. Uh, when something is a node on the IoT, it can suddenly be rented out, shared, uh, utilized on a pay for use basis right, in a, in, a, in a sharing economy. Sharing economy is actually a terrible name. It's actually a rental economy. People don't want to share their things. They want to rent their things, earn money for it. Uh, but IoT turns products into services. Right? And so mobility is becoming a service. Uh, AI, uh, or automation or autonomy, uh, the introduction of AI and machine learning into the vehicles right, are allowing the vehicles to pursue complex goals. Now, what's a complex goal? Uh, a car 
right, automatically stopping when it senses uh, an obstacle in front. That's not a complex goal. That's just stimulus response. A more complex goal would be keep the passenger safe, a car that speeds up, right, when it sees that it's going to be in an accident to get to an intersection and avoid the accident. That's a little more complex and takes more reasoning, takes a little bit more intelligence. Uh, and so automakers are embedding that and much more into their cars. And they're making their cars uh, be able to make those complex, pursue those complex goals autonomously. Uh, people talk a lot about autonomy, uh, but it probably will be, and in spite of all the announcements you hear about, you know, this or that car maker uh, is going to have a level five autonomous car next year, that probably isn't going to happen, right? Uh, autonomy is actually much farther away uh, than uh, the press release suggests. Uh, you will see autonomy in specialized conditions. You will see it in Mountain View, California, where everybody obeys the rules. It's always sunny, the lanes are wide, uh, and the, draft, the traffic conditions are not difficult. Uh, you will not see it in, uh, outside here in, in, in Delhi uh, anytime soon. Uh, the driving conditions are just much more difficult. Uh, but cars, long before they're driving around in Delhi autonomously, will be doing something else that's even more revolutionary, and they'll be doing it autonomously. And what is that? They'll be transacting autonomously with their environment. Right? They'll be buying and selling data. They'll be paying for roads as they go. They'll be paying for infrastructure as they go. Importantly, cities will also be able to ask them to pay for congestion, pollution, these other things that have been sort of the holy grail of city management uh, for decades, but that cities had, didn't have the tool to ma tools to manage, now will become possible uh, because microtransactions can take place uh, and incentives can be used to get drivers and vehicles to behave in the way that city managers might want. And what is it uh, that enables that? It's blockchains. And that's why I include the B for blockchains on my list of the disruptions that are happening in the auto industry. Blockchains being a tamper-proof ledger in which transactions are recorded chronologically, uh, publicly or privately, uh, but immutably. So this slide I, I stole from BMW uh, with credit. Uh, BMW, we hosted a, one of these colloquiums at BMW's headquarters in Munich last February, and the, uh, the head of their uh, IT department gave a talk, uh, and they put up this slide, which I thought was quite amazing, uh, because it was the first time I'd seen a senior executive, a major automaker, say uh, that the three pillars of their future uh, was Internet of Things, which everybody would agree, uh, artificial intelligence, would everybody agree? Uh, but blockchain was the third. So there's that third leg of the stool, right, included. Uh, and why? What was the reason? Right? He said, the confluence of blockchain, IoT, and AI enables every entity, i.e., person, machine, or thing, to have an identity, be intelligent, and transact with other entities. Again, it's, it's enabling this machine-to-machine -machine economy, uh, to make, enabling micropayments, uh, enabling the use of incentives to change human behavior uh, and to change the way our cities work, the way our traffic flows, uh, the way people move around. So let me pull out for a minute and talk about what's going on with devices. Somebody said uh, in the opening yesterday, uh, uh, we talked about how fast uh, IoT devices were increasing. And I think they had slightly different numbers and a slightly different source. Uh, but basically, uh, we're at uh, 25 a billion or so today. So more IoT devices than people, more connected devices than people, doubling every two or three years. So if you just begin to extrapolate that out, uh, you're over a trillion right, by 2030. Now, who knows if, the, uh, if that trend continues or speeds up or slows down but it will undoubtedly be a very big number. But that isn't really what I wanted to show you. I want to show you this next graph, uh, which is the number of potential connections, right, which increases right, proportional to the square of the number of devices. So, so if you think of the number of connexes, connections and the number of, of potential parties to a transaction that you would have to keep track of, right, it becomes quickly unmanageable without something like blockchain managing identities and security 
right, and keeping track of, uh, of, of, of or enabling trust between those transactions. Uh, the, uh, that exponential orange curve there is the number of potential, connection, uh, potential connections. And when you graph that on the same graph as the number of connected devices, the connected devices, which on the previous graph were, were exponential, now look, sorry, now look like a flat line. I get excited when I talk about this stuff. Sorry. All right. So the point of all that is identity, provenance, and authenticity are major problems in a digital world, right? We see this today, right? Already on the internet, when you get that email from that Nigerian prince, right, who's offering you a million dollars, right, to help him arrange a simple cross-border currency transaction, right? And you don't know, right, whether this is the best deal you've ever seen in your life or somebody trying to get access to your bank account. Well, humans are pretty good, right, at knowing a fraud on the internet. Now, right, we have to get better all the time because the fraudsters get, get more sophisticated. Uh, but the fraud is increasing. And the reason it's increasing is because the internet is a distributed, right, and largely anonymous medium. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you look at the traffic, uh, more than 50% of the traffic on the internet is now bots and more than 50% of that automatic traffic is now malicious, and that number is increasing. But this problem, right, becomes much more difficult, right, in a machine economy. One, there are a lot more things out there, right, to keep track of, right, and it's much more difficult for a machine, right, uh, to be able to recognize fraud. They're not quite as good as humans are, right, at recognizing the Nigerian prince for what it is. Uh, and so this, uh, this will become a much bigger problem. And this is why blockchains become so important and so critical in this machine economy. Let me shift gears a minute and talk a little bit about the way Mobi works. Uh, Mobi uh, is member-driven and member-supported. We're a nonprofit. We're supported almost entirely by our member dues. Uh, we work through working groups. Uh, when a, a certain number of members tell us we want you to start a working group on X subject, uh, we'll start a working group on X. Uh, the first working group we started was very clear. We needed uh, digital identity because everything else is based on digital identity. Uh, and uh, the, the goal of what the working groups is trying to do is to create an application layer or an application layer standard for how uh, transactions can occur with vehicles and people and machines in this, uh, in this machine economy, or machine mobility economy. The first working group launched almost nine months ago was Vehicle Identity and History. That was the digital twin. Uh, we try in our working groups to have them chaired by two big companies, uh, two of our larger members. In this case, the group was chaired by Renault and Ford. After working for nine months, they're now circulating uh, our first standard, uh, our digital ID. Uh, that's being circulated amongst our members. We hope to release it, uh, publish it in the next uh, 60 days or so. Uh, they keep telling me, don't mention any dates, uh, so I shouldn't do that. But uh, we hope to publish it very soon. Um, and the second group uh, we started last year was usage-based insurance. That was chaired by two large global insurance companies, Acme of the Netherlands and AOE of Japan. Uh, in 2019, uh, just this quarter, uh, we're launching three additional working groups. Uh, one, electric vehicle to grid integration. That one's chaired by Honda and GM. Uh, supply chain, uh, I think that one will be chaired by Ford and we're looking for uh, a second chair for that. Uh, vehicle data exchange, uh, which is chaired by um, uh, Denso and GM. Uh, and those working groups are either uh, just started or will be starting very shortly. Uh, in the third quarter, we hope to launch uh, finance and securitization. Uh, I think we have a, a panel and some talks on finance and securitization and mobility later today, uh, and rideshare car share. Uh, there's another area our members are interested in. Uh, the last thing we do, uh, in addition to the colloquiums and the working groups and the publication of standards, is something called the Mobi Grand Challenge, uh, which you're going to hear a little bit more about later today. Uh, it's a X Prize style event. So if you remember uh, the X Prize, uh, um, uh, uh, it's loosely based on the original DARPA Grand Challenge, if you remember that. Uh, roughly 15 years ago, the, de the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, uh, put up a big prize money 
uh, to spark the development and public attention and uh, research into autonomous vehicles. And uh, we have a, a video on YouTube about, about this that includes some footage from that original DARPA Grand Challenge. But it was incredibly successful because the first year, the cars fell, failed miserably at the challenge. But by the second year, seven cars actually completed the challenge and, and, and won and claimed the prize money. Uh, and so what we were trying to do with the Moby Grand Challenge uh, was create a, uh, uh, a, uh, a challenge around connected, coordinated autonomy which we think is much more powerful than sort of standalone uh, autonomy that the DARPA was originally investigating and, and trying to promote. Uh, that original phase of the Grand Challenge was concluded with an award ceremony at BMW headquarters in Munich uh, in February, and uh, we're launching the second phase of that here today. Uh, we expect it to be a three-year challenge, and the end of it all, uh, we hope to be able to demonstrate uh, uh, viable ad hoc ad hoc uh, networks of uh, vehicles uh, in a mobile ecosystem, uh, transacting, making micropayments, uh, exchanging data with their environment, with infrastructure, with other vehicles, negotiating rights of way, contributing to safety uh, and, and speed and efficiency of transit within a city. Uh, some of the early results from studies suggest that you can increase the, throup the throughput in a congested city by uh, four or five times with coordinated autonomy uh, versus standalone autonomy. So the potential is, is, is quite large. Uh, this is not just fantasy. Uh, uh, two months after we announced the grand challenge around this uh, coordinated uh, autonomous mobility, uh, GM filed a patent uh, for exactly what we had been talking about two months earlier. Now GM, uh, the representative from GM to Moby, in fact he's on our board, uh, is the head of GM's uh, strategy. So it could be coincidence, uh, but it also, uh, the timing was suspicious. But, uh, so <laughs> the point is, uh, this, this isn't just fantasy stuff, right? Automakers are filing patents on this. This is research that's going on. This is real stuff in the real world that's happening. Uh, so with that, I, I was going to take questions, but I think since we're running behind, we'll defer the questions to the, the breaks and just go, uh, ready, go to the break. All right, great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with this we uh, wrap up our first session and now I request Mr. Behel to please hand over a token of appreciation to all our eminent guests here on the dais. Over to you. Oh, I'm <laughs> going to talk. Um, ladies and gentlemen, just a brief interjection as far as I'm concerned. Um, I did notice that one of our attendees as a delegate out here this morning was uh, using his mobile phone to click a snapshot of one of the slides. But I do want to assure you, and if I do have uh, Moby's permission, are we putting up your presentations on our website? Sorry? Yeah, but is it okay if we were to put your presentations up on the website? Okay with me. Yeah? Okay? Okay. So uh, you'll get the presentations available on the website and it'll happen immediately, almost as soon as we finish this session. I hope I'll be able to get my staff to be able to put it onto the website almost immediately. So you have access to all the information and the data, uh, at least by the end of today, if not immediately. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, all the speakers. Uh, ladies and de gentlemen, I do want to encourage you to visit the exhibition as well. And I'm just going to give you one brief example. Um, I was requested by Richa and uh, Moby to spend my time out here as much as I could, and I unfortunately have to beg that I'm not going to be able to do that because it's important for me to be outside as well to um, see what the other offerings are. And I was delighted to see one particular offering right now. And I'm just going to mention it out of interest and nothing else. It has no connection as far as... Uh, uh, blockchain and autonomous mobility is concerned. Um, it's, a, it's a South African company called GeoSense, and uh, they have uh, a uh, 3D visual, uh, visualization of various applications which they can offer. And there was a large range of activities which uh, this particular process of theirs can provide, and that is also automotive design is one of them. 
So I do encourage people to go out and talk to exhibitors. You may not be a customer, but certainly you're somebody that they will appreciate talking to. And uh, who knows, you get some ideas about what you are able to uh, do with the offerings that are at the expo. So, and in fact, I'm gonna make this particular request to Mr. Anil Srivastava right now, that if he has time, I'd like to be able to take him around for maybe just this one demonstration. You might find an idea which is acceptable to uh, the, the uh, administration to be used in wherever you feel it's important for. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for your patience. And I do encourage you to come and sit here as much as you can as well for the rest of the day. Uh, you can move out during the other opportunities that are available at the breaks. And uh, to start with, uh, I'd like to make the first uh, presentation of our token of appreciation to uh, Mr. Anil Srivastava, and then I'll go down the line. Thank you. I request the speakers to please come forward for a group photograph group together. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we'll break for tea and coffee now. For I would request the guests to please carry their beverages inside the hall because we start the session right in 15 minute, uh, five minutes. So 11.05, we'll have our first speaker, Dr. Praful Chandra, on the podium at the day speaking. Thank you, speakers. <laughs>